Let us pause for a moment. Just close our eyes. Pause in gratitude for those who made this happen. Those who, from the beginning, allowed the seminary and its formation to start up in the monastery first and then hereafter. Gratitude for the all the rectors from the first one until the current rector, all the staff, all the students. For Count Fimba Ryan, who, against the green and the odds, pushed to start it. And for all of us who are gathered here today, that we can be part of this event reflect back on the 80 years, and look forward to the years that are to come. Father, we thank you for this time that we share, for the gift of theological reflection in our context, for the offering of this seminary that has allowed us that space of theological reflection in the formation of seminarians, the formation of ministers, for not only our church, but for many churches. We ask, Lord, that as we enter into this day, that you may give us minds and hearts that are open wide and fire our imagination for the church that you desire in our region. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Archbishop J. Charles Jason Gordon, Archbishop of Port of Spain, Abba John Pereira, and the Benedictine community, the Dean of the Seminary, of John Vianney and the Ugandan Martyrs, Dr. Donna James, the General Secretary of the AC, and lecturer, <laughs> Father Donald Chambers, the faculty and staff of the seminary. Reverend Dr. Adrian Sunarain, the Dean of St. Andrew's Theological Faculty. My dear students, in particular, our respondent, Stephanie, Ms. Stephanie Baldeo Singh, and the guest speaker, Reverend Dr. Monsignor Patrick Anthony, otherwise known as Paba. <laughs> At this time, I want to welcome all of you to celebrate with us this 81st or the closing of the 80th anniversary, marking this as a special time of grace and blessing for us indeed as, as a seminary. From the very inception, Archbishop Fimber Ryan, in naming the seminary John Vianney, began a process of enculturation and contextualization of the theological reflection and affirmation of the people. And so it is for this very reason that he called the seminary the Af seminary of the African martyrs that will be later been known as the Ugandan seminary. This name was given because of the opposition that he had received and the idea that, that men from the Trinidad and Tobago from the Caribbean were not capable of becoming priests. One of the primary purposes of a Caribbean seminary is to place the process of formation into the local, societal, and ecclesial context. And so today we gather to celebrate this and to affirm all that we have done and all that we continue to do in marking and in making the seminary of John Vianney and the Ugandan martyrs indeed a place where we can find ourselves, see our faces, and celebrate the presence of God in the midst and the context of God's people. Welcome to this, this theological reflection, my dear friends. Good afternoon. 
beloved. <laughs> when I read and reflected on Pope Francis' motu proprio ad theologiam promovendam, in relation to the first part of the theme of today's gathering, turning point, I remarked to myself that theological reflection in the Caribbean has already turned the point and continues turning the point. For example, the motto proprio calls for a prophetic theology that addresses the rapid cultural and societal changes of our times. It also speaks of a paradigm shift in theological reflection, quote, grounded in everyday lives of people from all corners of the globe and across all walks of life. It also speaks of a interdisciplinary and a transdisciplinary theology that is interconnected with other fields of study. It also speaks about a synodal approach to doing theology and also a pastoral stamp of theology that looks, quote, at, a real, at real life situations and the different conditions people live in. But is not this the type of theology that is being taught and done within the formation space of this 80-year-old theological institution? Is not this the type of theology that the Caribbean Council of Conference of Churches began in the 1970s with the missiological project of the committee of their committee led by Idris Hamid, a Presbyterian pastor, uh, pastor and, and theologian? Isn't this the type of theology that is reflected in the pastoral letters of the Catholic bishops of the Antilles Episcopal Conference from Antilles Bishop Speaks on Black Power in 1969? to their final one in, 90, in 2018, a mandate for the kingdom, mission, and evangelization? Is not this the type of theology that is being done among the members of the conference in theology in the Caribbean today since 1994? I ask the students, is this not the type of theology that is being done with you today at St. John Vianney and the Uganda Martyrs in this institution? Yes, it is. Caribbean theology has drawn mainly from this way of doing theology, which can be attested in the life and ministry of St. Lucian Bourne and the St. John Vianney and the Uganda Martyrs seminar, seminary formed Monsignor the Honorable Dr. Patrick Anthony, a.k.a. Baba. As the seminary celebrates its 80th year, it can proudly say that it has given birth to a son, Baba, whose exploits have taken him out of the confines, quote, of the church into the world and back. And these include, among many others, a, founding, a founder member of the Monsignor Patrick Anthony Folk Research Center established in 1993 in St. Lucia, co-founder of the Conference on Theology in the Caribbean Today, CTCT, and also instrumental in creating, and I think you, we saw it there, the, the Jeune Creole, a St. Lucia national event festival held annually across the island on the last Sunday of October. This afternoon, Pabba will reflect with us on the history of contextual theology and its role in developing such a praxis while attempting to point the way forward for the Caribbean church at this time. If Pabba is the son of the parent St. John Vianney and the Uganda Martyrs. In that case, it is fair to say that today's responder, Ms. Stephanie Baldia Singh, a Presbyterian minister in formation, is a grandchild of this 80-year-old institution. 
as a second year theology, uh, a theology student and recently joined a member of CTCT, she will reflect on the meaning of the theological enterprise for today. What cultural, what actual hopes and challenges emerge? What, what's the meaning or what meaning does contextual theology hold for the Caribbean today? Without further ado, let us put our hands together as we welcome Pabba to journey with us this afternoon. Friends have been journeying for so long, I'm tired. <laughs> but it's always a pleasure, a joy to be able to join hands and reflect and pause for a moment as to what God has been doing in us and through us in this Caribbean region. And for me, this is an extraordinary privilege. I mean, I was telling the seminarians this afternoon, I came here as a, <laughs> straight from high school, <laughs> didn't wait for my results, <laughs> so anxious to get here, well, to get away from <laughs> <laughs> And um, all the struggles we went through, the, the challenges, the mountain tops, the valleys, and so. And yet still, after all of this time, I left the seminary in 72. So you can guess how long it has been, right? A okay. A while, huh? And the joy of being part of the seminary and continuing somehow to extend the work of the seminary out there is a joy unparalleled. Because for me, it's the work of God. It's the work initiated by God in the Caribbean and of which we are all instruments, we are participants in it. But particularly today, I think it is an extraordinary privilege to, to be able to articulate what I think the Caribbean can do, has been doing, and should be doing for the world. You see, we are living at a time of my opinion really low, 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 low. A time of spiritual bankruptcy, a time of moral moribund incompetence, a time when people were supposed to be leading the world and guiding humankind are caught in such duplicity, hypocrisy, and are the same persons who are the ones who are giving authority, determining values, dictating what should be, what shouldn't be, what is right and what is wrong. It makes me feel particularly privileged now, I'm from a place, a region, where we can say our people can show the world that seems to have forgotten what it is to be human, that we can show the world what it is to be human. And for me, this is what the work of the seminary, the work of theology in the Caribbean is all about. You see, when God created the world, he saw that it was good. When God created the Caribbean, we can look back and say, he saw that it was not just very good, but extraordinarily good because of the role that we are called to play in humankind today. We can stand with our heads high today and say to the world, we have never, never, never abused people. We have been abused. We have never massacred people. We have been massacred. Despite all of that, 
we have continued to try to love. And that's the message that we can show the world because the world seems to have forgotten how to love. So today I'm going to try to respond to Pope Francis's motu proprio, his little of the glands response as he tried to put his signature to some norms for the Pontifical Academy. Now, the, the, for me, the preamble of this, all I'm going to say is the man himself, Pope Francis. You see, I think in Francis, we have a human being with a heart. A human being who experiences experience that comes from the heart. It's sort of a heart-based experience who relates to people, to institutions, and so forth from a heart place. And he's coming up again, a world, a society, a culture that is head-based. Thought, thinking, rationality. And he's a kindred spirit to us. We as Caribbean people, we are heart people. We are a feeling people. We are a sensed people. We are not a rational, abstract kind of person. The Caribbean person is one who is moving from the soul, from the belly, <laughs> from the heart. And it is the heart of Francis that has brought him to this understanding of what we call pastoral, the pastor, the shepherd, the shepherd. One who cares, as I was saying to Archbishop, I've been using this, this concept of the role of the Archbishop because of the power of the symbols. The symbol of the shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes to look for the one that is lost. One. In our culture, in our world today, one is dispensable. Not only one, but thousands are dispensable. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands are collateral damage. But for Francis, one. Every hair on the head is counted. Francis helps the world to understand again the inalienable dignity of the human person. That is bedrock Catholic theology. But not practice Catholic Christianity. Because there are many Catholics <laughs> who do not practice what they preach. But Francis is pulling us back to a conversion to a transformation of our relationship with the world. And it's coming from a position of a heart, a pastor. So Francis, like the shepherd, who cares for the lost sheep, who is there to protect the sheep when the wolf comes, who is prepared not to run away and hide like the hyena, but to stand up and fight, and to use his staff to defend the vulnerable, the little, the tiniest ones. That's the heart of Francis. That's a place from which Francis, from his experience in Latin America, in Argentina, so, has brought to the universal church. The shepherd, we are told, places his staff across the gate. So that when the sheep are returning from pasture, they would pass underneath the staff and all the fleece of the sheep would be ruffled. You know why? To see if they're injured. <laughs> because if the sheep just go in and it's bleeding inside, it will get gangrene. <laughs> so the shepherd's staff is a symbol of compassion and mercy. 
That's what Francis' heart is about. It's out of that heart, that pastoral, the pastoral care, concern, that we get this sensitivity that has become so iconic. I mean, he says, you know, if you are a Christian, and for us today, if you are a, theolog a theologian, your theology must come from a position where you don't only talk about the sheep in your beautiful air conditioned room. You must smell. Smell it. You must smell it. Smell it. And you know, the messy things are not too nice. And we try to keep away from it. But it is there. It is there. There on that place where Christ was crucified. Huh? The dung heap. <laughs> the dung heap. The messy place. Hmm? Like the stable where he was born. It is there that the reality is. Where God is present. Where God is present. In the mess. In the mess. So for me, Francis stands for that. And all that Francis says in this motu proprio to the world comes from that heart position. He says to theologians, look, move from a heart place, not a head place. So your reflection as a student of theology, your exposition as a professor of theology, whatever way in which you're involved in theology, let it not be abstract up there. Let it be incarnate from a position of sensitivity to people and their needs. So, I would like to begin by going back to the origins we said of this institution because the, we are celebrating 80 years We're celebrating 80 years. And in reflecting, I would say that there seem to be traditions in the history of theology in the seminary based on the leadership of the seminary. Of course, as Archbishop Jason said, we thank the Benedictine monks who studies all, and you can see the first rectors, all Benedictines, including my own rector, Padre von Scruz. When I entered, he was the one who was the rector at the time. But after him came, we have Father Michel Devotai, still a religious. So we had the Benedictines who were religious, then we had Father Michel Devotai, who was a spiritan. And so the formation was understandably the formation that would come from a religious spirituality. Benedictine, spiritan, and otherwise. It was not until Father Cyril Ross who was the first diocesan. Then we have that tradition of diocesan leadership in the formation. So we started off with the Benedictines, religious. We had the Spiritans, religious. And I meant Joe was also a Spiritan. And of course, we came to the diocesans. Among the diocesans, Sir Ross was the first who was, he was actually formed here in the seminary. And he took over the leadership of the seminary. After him came Henry. Henry began the studies here, went, to, went overseas, and then came back to run the seminary. John Menz, after him, was again formed here. So we have a tradition of 
locals who are formed here, who are trying to lead the, the seminary and lead the development of theology through a seminary. Because the seminary was really the only place where formal theological reflection in the Catholic tradition was taking place in the seminary. It is in that context, the seminary, that we're going to see what was the background in which the Benedictines took over the seminary, the Spiritans, and then the Diocesans. In his letter, Pope Francis explains that the history of the academy founded by the Roman pontiffs was a kind of a history of doing theology that is re just research, research in philosophy and theology, and that was what theoretical formation is all about. So we can say that from the earliest days, the Roman, Roman um, pontiffs, their the institutions, and our own, would have come out of that spirit in which is philosophy, theology, sort of discourse between theology and philosophy and so forth. And as Pope John Paul II would say, the principal mission of theology consisted in promoting dialogue between revelation and the doctrine of the faith and in offering an ever deeper understanding of it. So the famous um, Anselmian, Fides Quirens Intellectum, faith seeking understanding. So it's really faith. I'm using the mind to understand the precepts of faith and so forth. This is just a description of how the motu proprio came. It was, as he was approving the statutes for the Pontifical Academy, that he appended this to it. And the document itself is a very short document. It is only about 1,500 words and 10 sections. Now, some commentators have said that to understand this document by Francis, it has to be seen in the context of a number of other documents. And I think um, for the Jason sent us an article that, that illustrates that. So you, you shouldn't just take this letter to theologians by, the, by itself. But we should look at what Francis has been doing in Laudate Deum, what he's did in the Synod of the Church in Mission that came out of the Synod the report, the, the sort of synthesis. And also, of course, the famous yeah. Fiducia Supplicans, which everybody is talking about. Yeah? Everybody. Everybody is talking about. You know? But you see, you, to, to understand this document to the theologians, to the seminarians, and so forth, you have to see the context of what he was trying to do along the way. So when you take something like Laudate Deum, Francis was looking at the situation. It's a, it's a follow-up to the Laudati C. What has happened to the whole climate promises and whatnot? And Francis made a very important observation. He spoke of the seeming lack of capacity for global institutions that were supposed to be in the forefront of pushing the whole climate change agenda and reparation agenda, that somehow or other, those institutions seem to lack teeth. I mean, Francis could not have been more prophetic. Because today, look at those institutions that are supposed to be the monitors of peace in the world, and you see what? No teeth. No teeth. So, Within the context of his thinking that we should have a more people-centered 
approach, a more heart-centered approach. We can look at his letter to the theologians. In it, Francis calls for a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift. Now, he says that theological reflection is therefore called to a turning point. So all the tradition of theology we've had, going way back, up till this moment he's saying, that we have to take a new turn. We have to look differently. We have to have a, a different perception of what theology is all about. And we have to become sensitive to the environment, our culture, our social institutions, human experience, developments in medians. We have to take care of all of that. So we cannot come with the same old mindset and try to respond because theology is really responding to God's action in the world through our own dialogue with God's word and our experiences. So Francis is saying, look, let us stop, let us turn around, let us change. And a few words which are very common to us now, synodal, talk about synod, talk about listening, talking about participation, talking about inclusion, talking about all in it, talking about we don't have all the answers, talking about all that we call synodality. He says that this is the moment that we are in, and, and that, that, that Francis is, is coming again from that, that hard thing I told you about, from a hard sensitivity to the church and to Christians and to human society, people in general. So we let, come on, let us listen to people. Let us embrace people. Let people speak. Let them speak. Let them say how they feel. Let them express themselves. Because from all of that, we will discover the hand of God and the way that God is acting. Us. So he says that that kind of church needs a similar kind of theology. So an outgoing church can only be matched by an outgoing theology. And basically document there are six, I think I was about to say that um, you already gave a summary of what I was going to say. The main points, huh? the main points. In that just short document, 1,500 words, 10 points, huh? basically it said, look, we need to be a prophetic theology. Hmm? We have to shift our way of thinking, our way of viewing, our way of understanding. So he says that there must be a change in epistemology, our understanding, a change in methodology. If we can face the, 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 the world today. Then he comes up with a concept that is from the social sciences. What he called a concept of transdisciplinarity. Disciplinarity. Disciplinarity. Transdisciplinarity. And he makes a distinction between interdisciplinarity, that is weak and that is strong. We'll look at it later. Of course, the fourth point he said, a synodal approach, which I mentioned already. Then, number five, important. Francis says that theology must recover its sapiential nature. In other words, you see, God is mystery. God is mystery. So you approach God from perspective of contemplation and reverence and humble listening, which is counter the abstract scientific approach of clarity, knowledge, so, one, one, one buzzword he said, people saying, Francis is not, he, he lacks clarity. 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 You see? 
you see, when it comes, when it comes to things like mathematics, <laughs> when it comes to abstract concepts, yes, you can have clarity. When it comes to human relations, when it comes to people's experiences, it's shades of gray, <laughs> shades of gray. So when you're involved in reality, in the human, you will not be inclined to the abstract. You will be more open to the sapiential, the contemplative, the listening. And he's saying that, in fact, this is one of the contributions that theology can make to the social sciences and other sciences, that we can bring that understanding. Reality is not cut and dry. Then, of course, the pastoral stamp. There must be a pastoral stamp in theology. <laughs> in other words, theology must always be about caring. Hmm? About caring. If your theology is not about caring, it's not about pastoral, the pastor, then your theology is not service. Hmm? It is an exercise in intellectual I will not use the word. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, for me, this fundamental concept of transdisciplinarity is a foundational concept. Yeah. Mm. You see, he says that Normally, in the sciences, people could talk about interdisciplinary, multiple, multidisciplinary. So we'll, we'll hear what the sociologist has to say, we'll hear what the anthropologist has to say, what the polit economics has to say, what history has to say, what all the, all the different um, sciences, they are in a relationship in which we are just listening to each other. But of course, we listen to each other from our positions. So the economist says, this is economics, Politi this is politics, mm -hmm. the historian says, this is history, sociologists. So we listen to each other, but Francis is calling for a deeper relationship. He's calling for not just a listening, but a recognition that my understanding of reality from my particular science can learn from the understanding of other sciences. Are, are, you, are you, you, you following, you following? Are you following the concept? You see, there's, there's a way in which we can do, so for example, an economist can listen to a historian, and the historian talks about history and so forth. The economist says, well, that is history. Let me tell you about economics. So you remain segmented in your discipline. You are talking, multiple, huh? but you are not exchanging. That is not a relationship. So Francis calls for a relational kind of conversation. A conversation which economists can say, but it's now, what the historian is saying is helping us understand economics. Are you, are you following me? To see that your science is not an entity in its own right, but can learn about itself from other sciences. Now, when you apply that to theology, huh? theology, you see what is that saying? He's saying now, you can't come from a high horse position and say, we are the theologians, this is theology. We've got the truth from God, you know, and we've got it all. We know it. He say, hello. As you not only talk, but as you listen to the historians, and we'll come to this guy, Hilary Beckles, important for us in the Caribbean. Hmm? As you listen to Hilary Beckles, historian, he is telling you from his history, from his discipline, something about you and your theology. And you can learn and understand things about your theology from the historian. 
Now, this is extremely relevant for our Caribbean situation. But we'll get there. That's still explaining again. It's, it's all here. Theology must see itself as embedded in a web of relationships, first and foremost, with other disciplines and other knowledge, in a web of relationship. Hence, the arduous task for theology is to be able to make use of new categories elaborated by other knowledge. So theology can make use of new categories elaborated by other knowledges in order to penetrate and communicate the true faith. Hello, you understand what I'm saying there? Hmm? So if you, if you think you have the truth of faith and you want to communicate it, do not think that you have it all by yourself. But listen, listen, be humble, be contemplative, and listen to the airs of your heart to what the other sciences are saying. And you will learn things, categories, experiences, vocabulary, even vocabulary, huh? that can help you as you try to communicate your, 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 your truth. Hmm? And transmit the teaching of Jesus into this language with originality and critical awareness. If you stay in your silo, you become stuck. Static, moribund, you will die. You will die. But if you become embedded in relationship, then you will be growing as you grow in self-understanding and the others grow in... The, and so there will be this intercourse. That is this, what is called, transdisciplinarity. The, the, the disciplines trans as a fusing and helping each other. So, since Catholic theology today is done in many different kinds of institutions, such as universities, seminaries, monasteries, pastoral centers, and institutes, as well as in non-Catholic institutions, the question of, for the future of Catholic theology will remain, how to be academically rigorous, critical, and scientific, while remaining committedly ecclesial and synodal. One critic of Pope Francis <laughs> called for theology <laughs> to take into account contemporary experiences must be of service to the culture, must develop, must take into account the cultural revolution, must be bottom up, must be pastoral, must take into account the common sense of people, must be evangelical. He calls it a typical Francis document. Great deal of high sounding words that are very ambiguous. See the word? Ambiguous. Hmm? It is mostly bells and whistles, he said. Lamenting that the problem is, as is often the case with Francis, yeah, mm -hmm. as is often the case with Francis, mm -hmm. there is no mention of the theology that must be founded upon the traditional interpretation of scripture, the living theolog theological and magisterial tradition, the infallible teaching of the church, and be faithful to Catholic doctrine and moral teaching. You see, in other words, those are the bedrock Catholic things. You see? If you are faithful to the traditional interpretation of scripture, if you are faithful to the living theological magisterial tradition and the infallible teaching of the councils, and you are faithful to Catholic doctrine and moral teaching, then you are a real Catholic theologian. Now, you can see where the problem will arise. Because Francis, the shepherd, Francis, who has a passion for the sheep, will tell you that if you think that your interpretation of scripture is the only interpretation, and is the correct interpretation, and that you have nothing to learn from nobody else because you have the truth. 
then something wrong with you. But they say something wrong with him. You see? You see? Because as far as they're concerned, when you interpret scripture in a certain way, and you have clarity about the interpretation of scripture, then somehow or other, you have clarity about God. Idolatry. <laughs> Idolatry. Because the greatest sin is to think that you know God. Until you can become humble enough to know that you will never know God, you will constantly be gifted with the possibility of a relationship with God. But if you think you know God, and you know God so you can talk about God, and you can talk well about God, you can talk right about God, to the point that you can tell people, you're not talking about God. You're wrong. And not only that, but to the point that you will become so dogmatic that you want to kill people because of the way in which they're talking about God. Because you are the one who have the truth about God. Hello? <laughs> you, see, you see what Francis is getting at? Francis is saying, hello, let God be God. <laughs> Let God be God. And you be who you are. A humble, listening, prayerful creature of God who is struggling to enter into a relationship with God and who perhaps can help others in that struggle in a relationship. But you are not the one who controls God and has God in your back pocket and can tell God, can tell that one that you wrong and I right. So you see, friends, get ready for a popular. Hello? Get ready, yeah? P -p popular, yeah. Francis says that a transcendent knowledge, and at times, at the same time, Attentive to the voice of the people, thus popular theology, mercifully addressed to the open wounds of humanity and creation, and within the folds of human history to which it prophesizes the hope of ultimate fulfillment. Francis is saying that our theology must be people-centered, people-based, people's experience reflecting upon it. So when you have that kind of theology in which the people and their experiences and their voices and their fears and their hopes become the subject of your reflection, then you have a real people-centered theology. But he goes further and he makes a point here. He says that Therefore, it is necessary that the knowledge of people's common sense, the knowledge of people's common sense, which is, in fact, a theological place. Hello, are you all hearing that? Are you all hearing that? Francis said, people's common sense. But don't forget, don't forget that we are not in a privileged position in relation to God, over anybody else, you know. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> is relating to God. Everybody in their own experiences, their everyday experiences, they are struggling to come to know God. And they are understanding God. And they are reflecting their understanding of God. And he says, look, this, that the ordinary common sense of people is a theological place. That is why I have been using Just making the point again. That's why I've been using the experience of St. Lucia. The common sense of St. Lucians. The wisdom tradition of St. Lucians. The, the thing is, is that our stories, 
or folk tales. And Idris Hamid was the one who, in the early 70s, told us that, said that if you really want to understand people and you want to know where God is in people's lives, he said, go in the stories, go in the history, go in the folk tales, go in the real problems, and you will discover the wisdom of people. So when our ancestors, through their own travail, come up with sayings, he says, listen, listen to them, and let that be a theological place and a space because they are in dialogue with God. They are in relationship with God, and what they are saying is coming from expression from that relationship. So, I give you just one little example. I do these every week. I take a proverb, reflect. Hmm? So the proverb goes like this. Si kilibui, pati konet, gose tu gojli. Yi pati kai vale, gwen zaboka. If the hummingbird did not know the size of its throat, it would not have attempted to swallow the seed of a pear. Now, you see, if you see a bird trying to swallow a seed that seems too big, you are an outsider. We'll say, but that bird should be there. That bird can't be can real. But that's your human experience. The bird experience is that I can eat that seed. I, I, are you following? So you're coming from your own position and you're put, Im, imposing it on the experience that is there. But he said, instead of doing that again, instead of imposing, being, just listen, learn, sit back and watch, and you will see eventually that the bird swallows the seed. <laughs> you see? Huh? So I use these proverbs to try to demonstrate what popular theology, using the common sense, is all about. Hmm? Welcome, friends, to Lucian Talk, Jesus Talk, with me, Papa. Lucian Talk. Sikili bui pate konet gose tu gojli, i pate kai vale kwen zaboka. Which means, if the hummingbird did not know the size of its throat, it would not have attempted to swallow the pear seed. Katite le ne mo te kakachi le a le le kola ko. A poison when he shuts up to allay a pun, some will be fair. Exe mula ka pomwe sebi wi zib. Yo tsu ka mal pale mwe. Kadi guo mungo sa. Vri allay le kol an ko. Eble ma mele sa yo di. Mwe sav a che mwe. Epi a la mwe. Mwe kai jwen sik se. Kon sa. Mun pedi sayovli. Me si kili bui pate konet go se tu gojli. I pate kai vale gwen zaboka. Jesus talk. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4 verse 13. Challenges, challenges, challenges. So many last year. So many this year. Today. What do we bring to those challenges? We can come with belief in ourselves or the voices of others in our heads saying, it's impossible, it's impossible, it's impossible. However, deep within, we know our capacity. We know our potential. As our ancestors told us, if the hummingbird did not know the size of its throat, it would not have swallowed the pear seed. What may seem impossible for others may, with ambition and conviction, become possible for us. 
That's the spirit with which we St. Lucians as a people should face our challenges this 45th year of our national independence. Let the naysayers mourn and the faint hearted despair. But with belief in ourselves, we face the future with hope and courage. So, so what we do, we take a problem. We take a proverb that distills the wisdom of the experience of people. And we try to find a biblical text that will somehow or other illustrate the experience of our people. So in other words, we are showing that our people themselves, from their own experience, they have already had an encounter with God. And that encounter can be enhanced by the scriptures. And so we use that to help people read that the things that they're saying every day, coming from their own faith experience, is a way of theology, doing theology. And we do that every, every week. We do that to show people. Now, I want now to go to, in the light of Francis's document, to come to our Caribbean experience. A friend of mine, MacDonald Dixon, just wrote this poem. It's called, A New Kind of Rain is Falling from the Sky. A new kind of rain is falling from our skies, borrowing from metal, devouring flesh. Manan Lee's proud heraldic emblems wave, contradicting fury tumbling from our skies. Nothing is the hopeless cause we fight with tooth and nail. Our hopes and futures consciously suspend. Just the first line of that poem, a new kind of rain is falling from our skies. The people of Gaza know that kind of rain. The people of Sudan know that kind of rain. The people of Afghanistan know that kind of rain. A new kind of rain is falling from the sky. So we don't have to go to statistics. We just have to listen to the soul people around. And they help us to recognize what's happening. Langston Hughes, a long time ago, faced with a situation of racism in America, said, I'm so tired of waiting, aren't you? For the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let's take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. Our world, yes, there are some worms eating at the rind. For those of us who have a heart, our heart is paining. For those without a heart, that's the cause of what we're facing. And the last poem I want to share is um, a very powerful poem. It's by Nasser Rabba. Nasser is a Palestinian poet. Nasser has nothing to write on. And Nasser got strips of paper, bits of paper that he could put on. And he scribbled this poem. And he was trying to get it out to the world. And eventually, some journalists were able to bring it out. It was published by New Poetry. Dead cats continue to meow. In those days, we didn't pay attention to the complaints of walls. So much blood was on them. Who cares about walls that complain? One morning, we didn't find homes. 
Just heaps of red words piled like dirty clothes on the sidewalks. No one cared about them either. Couples, though, continued and without walls, their usual business. Not only that, but they made more kids who flayed more cats inside the school. The heart doctor treating me now recommends only one thing. Stop writing a diary of a dead village. I think this speaks louder than all the thousand bombs or all the shameless voices of media, world media. This speaks louder than that. Hmm? Now this for me is the context in which Francis is asking us to smell like the sheep. Theologians, he says, like pastors, must get into the heart of the mess and so that they actually smell. In other words, we must so be so involved and our own reflection must come from such a place that the human suffering in the world becomes a locus theologicus, a theological place for us. In the Caribbean, we need to have a conversion and reparation. You know why? Because our reality has been shaped, molded by powers who used, abused, and continue to abuse people for their own development, for their own progress. And Hillary has done a fantastic job in how Britain underdeveloped the Caribbean. A must for you, every one of you students must read that. To see how systematically this region of the world has been the victim of exploitation, extraction by Europe, all of Europe, Portuguese, Spaniards, French, all of them, all of them. In the history of the Caribbean, they are all guilty. They are all guilty. All of them. And today, they refuse to acknowledge that guilt because they realize that there will need to be reparation. So France, France, which made Haiti pay for the impertinence of setting themselves free. Pay. And the US that provided the funding when Haiti's economy could no longer provide the funding. So that 90% of Haiti's 90% of Haiti's production 90% was being used to pay France because France said you are too rude to demand independence. Same France that in seven or eight African countries demands that the French franc is the currency that they have to use. Same France. The same Britain has massacred so many people. The same Germans who did in Namibia. All of Europe, all of Europe. Europe is, has no moral or spiritual legitimacy to talk to us as Caribbean people. No legitimacy. That is why we now have to look at what... Um, well, that's, uh, that's just, yeah. We have to look at what our friend, one second told us. We like not above and so we must approach these people with a hermeneutic superstition, suspicion. Hermeneutic suspicion. In other words, what they tell us, the things they tell us, 
we have to be suspicious of their interpretation. So when you hear people are criticizing Francis because Francis is not giving the correct, faithful to the interpretation of scriptures, hmm? interpretation of the truth. We have to question. We have to have a hermeneutic suspicion of all they tell us is truth. Because they're liars and thieves. That's what they are. They're liars and thieves who've exploited people. You know how many thousands of native peoples were destroyed in the name of development, advancement? These are the people who are saying to them, want to dictate to us about truth and about values and so forth. Hermeneutic suspicion. Don't let them mamaga you. It, they done mamaga us long enough. Question, question, question. Question everything they say. Question everything they say and come from your position of confidence that you have a right to question, you have a right to challenge, and you have a right to show them because they don't know. From what they have shown us, the experience, the experience of Europe has shown us Europe does not know what it is to be human. The United States of America, you know the first nation in all of its pious postures, the first nation to drop two nuclear bombs was the United States of America. <laughs> What can people who have done that tell you about being human? What can they tell you about that? So we as Caribbean people, we are in a position to say to the world, you people don't know what life is all about. You don't know what life is all about. Come to us. We have been victims. And we still, despite being victims, we are still charitable to you. We're still charitable to you. We're still talking to you. We'll still talk to you. We say welcome you. We say welcome you. Learn from us. So the position that we Caribbean theologians must take is a position in which we have to scrutinize our history, scrutinize our experiences, learn from our ancestors. Learn from the mistakes the, the barbarians have done. Learn from their mistakes so that we don't repeat it. So that we can show them the new humanity that the world needs. Unfortunately, one sad thing about us, well, I mean, I don't have to tell you about, you, you, know, this, the, the, you know about the slave Bible? Hmm? You know about the slave Bible? You never heard about the slave Bible? Yes, read about the slave Bible. When those who were colonizing us cut off all parts of the Bible that had to do with revolution, liberation, and they presented a book that is filled with piety, and that's the Bible they brought to the slaves, called the slave Bible. Read about it, research it. Hmm? Morris. Graper has done a beautiful study of how in South Africa apartheid was a religious project. A religious project. Supported, grounded, structured in religion. The Dutch Reformed theology. Read it, read it. When you read, when you read those things, you'll understand why I talk about a hermeneutic suspicion of what people tell you, what people present to you. Question, question, so that you can come to your own truth. Own truth. Now, we are world-class people. We are world-class. We produce global figures. Today, you go to Russia, you go to China, 
people singing Bob Marley's songs. Yeah. Yeah. Russia, China, they sing Bob Marley's songs. Huh? We have produced world class people. Not only a Derek Walcott, Alpha Lewis, a Vijay Naipaul, huh? but we produce Brian Lara, huh? Usain Bolt. We, in all fields, we produce superstars. We are capable, we are capable, we are capable. The question is this, how is it that we are capable in all human endeavors, but when it comes to religion and spirituality, we are mendicants, asking people to teach us. Why? What has happened to our self-confidence? So we are self-confident in all fields, but when it comes to our own spirituality, and our own capacity, we are lollipatan, huh? A theology for you must be a theology of self-affirmation, of your equality to anybody on this planet Earth before God, and a recognition of your destiny to show the world, show the world, because what the world has shown us has not been very nice. So we are celebrating um, 80 years since this seminary started doing theological formation. Along the way, a number of institutions have emerged parallel, attempting to do what our brother was saying at the beginning, that, you know, we have been, <laughs> we have been ahead of <laughs> what Francis was talking about. We've been doing that. We've been doing that from the onset. When we started the Theology Conference huh, 30 years ago, people like Eva Johnson, who is here with us, hmm? who was one of the contemporaries of Idris Hamid, huh? people like Michel de Vatai, huh? people like Henry Charles, people like Martin Serju, all of these guys. When we first met, we were talking about what the CCC, with people like Idris, huh? and I see Jerry in, is there in the audience with uh, Jared Granado. Huh? What the CCC had, had said to us, look, man, you can, a new Caribbean consciousness, that you can look at your reality, you can reflect on your, let nobody come and talk to you about your reality. You can talk about your reality. You can share your reality. Mm -hmm. From the outset, we've been doing that. When we were doing theology, poor Martin Sergio. When we were going to all areas, and if you go through the confronting the waves, you will see the kind of topics we were looking at. We Caribbean theologians, we were looking at violence, we were looking at sexuality, we were looking at all kinds of things. Huh? We have years, decades of reflection. Which some people say, oh, these guys are doing Anthropology, they're doing theology, they're doing sociology, they're not doing theology. Some of them, they're poetry, literature. What Francis is asking people to do now, we've been doing that from the outset, from the beginning. So you have a wealth of resources. And Archbishop Jason was talking about the project he did when people like the, uh, your rector were doing. Caribbean theology of him. Getting all the efforts, hello, the efforts, the efforts. This is where the theology, in our efforts, in our efforts. We don't want anybody to come and tell us that is right or that is wrong. They told us that. One Archbishop of Port of Spain told us at the conference. I'm telling you all frankly, not this one. Huh? He, he, was, he, he was one of us at that time. <laughs> said to us, look, I am not going to defend you all in Rome. You all have to defend yourselves. 
Paul Martin Sergio. Martin was the one who used to write the reports on our conference. And he would publish it with Michelle and June and them in the Catholic, Catholic News. And boy, some people blow up. And blah, 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 blah. That's not theology. That, 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 that. That's not theology. <laughs> you see, theology has come from, from, from Europe, you know? <laughs> yeah. they, these, they know what theology is all about. You all don't know what theology is about. So we have, we have those decades of our reflection. I want to big up, by the way, today let's still pray for um, Felix Edinburgh. He has some heavy challenges. Felix, from the beginning of our conference, Felix has recorded every conference. Every conference. He has been documenting it. Videotaping, recording before videotaping and so forth. And now, with the help of Jedi Budu, all of that stuff is now being digitized so that we have available from the very beginning a vast resource of material for you, students of theology, to probe and explore, to see the wealth of material that is there. You don't have to go outside and let people outside there tell you what is you have here. You can find that. So we have a tremendous amount of stuff. We have people like um, Michelle Devotai. Michelle Devotai. Michelle Devotai. <laughs> Pope Francis might have been listening to him. Michel de Vitae was the one who constantly kept on saying to us, Look, theology is not about academia. Theology is about people's experiences. So you have ordinary people, ordinary people, like a housewife, like Gloria Bertram. Gloria, stand up, let people see who you are. A housewife who is involved in what they call Pots and pans theology. Yeah, that's Caribbean theology. Pots and pans, housewives. That, that's the kind of thing Michelle has been instilling us an awareness of our people because people, look, our people matter. <laughs> our people in front of God, they matter. So besides the, um, the theology conference, I started the Focus at Center 50 years ago. We're celebrating 50 years this year. When I started to say, Oh, what is it? This culture, the culture, the culture, culture, business, culture. What have, what have to do? Theology. Mm -hmm. Listen to Paul now. Listen to Francis now. Listen to Francis. <laughs> Forty years ago, we started a provincial association of diocesan clergy in the province of Castries. Because when we as diocesan clergy tried to meet at a regional level, we were told we had no canonical validity. So we tried among ourselves. We went and gave support to, to the Grenadians during the Great Revolution. Out of that came this association of Dallas and clergy. 40 years. This year, this year, look at it. 40th annual associate, that doesn't include the problem of Castries, celebrating 40 years. We, we meet as the Austin clergy from around the OECS and we discuss what it is to be a priest in the OECS today. What it is to be a priest? What is our pastoral, our people? Theology is the kind of theology that Francis is talking about. We've been doing that for 40 years. So long before Francis, we dare, we dare already. Huh? Messy. <laughs> so, in short, Francis gave a beautiful motu proprio. Wonderful calling for turning point, calling for theology to be people based, to be contextual and whatnot. We have been doing it. We have been doing from the onset. And let me tell you, we have to show the world. So, students, people like 
Kati, um, um, Monsignor um, Cabot, myself, and um, well, Archbishop still young, but you know, we we are we are getting on there. Every other people like us, we are we're going on. But you all, you all are the younger ones coming up, huh? You are the ones who have to stand on the legacy of the work that we have done. Show the world what Caribbean people have been able to do. And above all, show the world that we know how to be human. One last thought. I was sharing with him, you know. Where in the world, in one country, you can have a state funeral in a Christian church, a state funeral in a Hindu rite, a state funeral Muslim rite. And I'm sure if we have a Shango Baptist, first program, we'll have a state funeral Shango Baptist. Only in the Caribbean, only in Trinidad, where every creed and race finds an equal place. The world needs to find that formula. I have so much more to tell you about West Indian cricket and so I mean, there's some. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So thank you, thank you, Baba, for speaking from your heart and speaking to our heart, for taking us on this transdisciplinary journey from the heart of Francis to the challenges of theological reflection in the Caribbean today, and challenging us to truly engage in a hermeneutic of suspicion and endorsing us as true Caribbean sons and daughters to have pride in ourselves, to have confidence in ourselves, and to touch base with the common sense of our people, out of which you have challenged us, our theology and our spirituality ought to emerge. Thanks for giving us that confidence. Thanks for giving us, sharing with us your experience um, in St. Lucia and the wider Caribbean. Thank you very much. And without further ado, I invite Stephanie, or the grandchild, <laughs> to come forward and share with us. With all protocols being recognized and observed, good afternoon. Today, we are gathered to reflect and build upon Pope Francis's call for theological renewal, ad theologiam provocandum. And I am deeply grateful and honored to stand before you to give a student response to this powerful apostolic letter. We already know that ad theologiam promovendum is a call for courageous cultural revolution that is supposed to transform theology from being what Pope Francis calls desk theology to being missionary, contextual, synodal, and outgoing. And as we have already heard, it calls for the prominence of a type of theology that is rooted in the concrete reality of the world and of human beings. A type of theology that adapts and flows through time and space and is able to fill the gaps of existence because it would already be intrinsic to existence. The thing is, as we have heard from Papa's feature address, and even Father Don's introduction, Caribbean theology is special. The formation of Caribbean theology has seemingly always taken this route, the contextual route, to be missionary to the Caribbean, contextual to the Caribbean, as synodal as possible, and certainly outgoing we would not even have a Caribbean theology that is specific to our lives and unique from the rest of the world if it were not so. So the first question that I've been taxed, taxed with exploring 
is the meaning of the theological enterprise for today. What does theology look like for us in our context, the 2024 Caribbean? To me, present day Caribbean theology can hardly be described in full as desk theology. The very thing that Pope Francis is warning us against because our theology has not really ever remained sitting on a desk. Our ancestors of faith, and even us today, have been challenged and even forced to theologize in our context for our context. Our ancestors were challenged with receiving theology from our very colonizers and forcing a way forward that allowed for a Caribbean connection to the already existing universal faith in Christ. This Caribbean connection means that there already exists a preferential option for our unique societies which could only really come from being absolutely rooted in the reality of the Caribbean context. Therefore, the second question that I'm supposed to touch on is, what meaning does contextual theology have for the Caribbean today? But Caribbean theology is contextual theology. Father Jason smiles because I learned from his class. <laughs> It is contextual and it is liberational. Liberation theology, as we know, aims to be built up from the position and the situation of the poor and the oppressed. And so if the theology of our Caribbean context already has this preferential option for our society, so that we could call it Caribbean theology, then that means it already has a preferential option for the poor, for the oppressed, for the outcast, for the sidelined, and for the weak. We have fought to ensure that it's not desk theology. And while there is always room for growth and improvement, at least we can be assured that we have always been working towards a contextual theology that is intertwined with our various pastoral ministries. So then, what is the point? We have gathered today to find a turning point. So what can our turning point be? And the thing is, for an apostolic letter this powerful, the Pope definitely feels so strongly that there is a gap between our theology and our ministry as the universal church of Christ across denomination. For the developed world, that gap can certainly oftentimes be between theology and societal reality where you have larger spaces and more populated areas that leave room for bigger and more gaps. But for the Caribbean, I don't think we have so much of that specific problem, on the surface level at least. Because like I said, and as Papa said, we have fought for Caribbean theology, and our theology constantly evolves to ensure that it does not lack contextuality. So then, to me, I think we have a different gap, a more personal one, a more internal one. It may not be a gap in the external societal environment that we try to theologize, to theologize in, but rather our internal situations, our internal places of oppression. So I have a question for us all. When we experience negative emotions for too long, like worry or fear or sadness or hopelessness or even anger, what is our automatic response? Even when these emotions are in response to a validly upsetting situation, isn't our automatic response, at least most of the time, to run and escape those feelings? Think about your own emotional being while I share with you a personal experience that showed me a very simple but practical connection between theology and our pastoral ministries. So over Advent and Christmas last year, 
I experienced a point of exhaustion. It was the end of the semester and I was physically drained, but more importantly for this reflection, I was drained emotionally. And this point of emotional exhaustion was triggered by many factors, which I'll share. It was the stress of the semester, but I was also burnt out. I was grieving for two persons that I missed immensely during Christmas. But I also was experiencing this deep sorrow for the true state of the world that we live in, in all of its violence and injustice and heartbreak. And I found my usually peaceful and joyful spirit be now filled with the exact opposite feelings. And as always, when I reached low points like this, I tried my best to escape. I had one more sermon to prepare for that year to be preached on Christmas Eve, but I felt so blocked and barricaded by my own emotions that in preparation, I was stuck because I felt like I couldn't escape from my low emotional state. And I felt like it was hard for me to connect to the Advent themes, love, joy, peace, and hope. But I felt like I had to escape still because I feared that the pain of my soul, because of what I was experiencing, would translate through my Christmas Eve message to the people that I would preach to. So I found myself praying and wrestling with God. God, please help me escape from this pain. Help me to compartmentalize my heart. This is me asking God to compartmentalize my feelings for me so that this sermon for these your people will be joyful and peaceful. And I pray like that every day, multiple times a day, with no progress. And instead of escaping my soul's context, it became even worse because the situation of the world that we live in continues to get worse. And until one day in prayer, the Lord talked on my heart and asked, why, child, do you think that to minister to this congregation, you have to escape your emotions? Why do you think that you have to separate and compartmentalize the reality of your soul and the reality of your world that you live in to minister to this congregation who is part of the world? Did I, God, ask you to do that? Or are you, child, just afraid of how real your pain is and how much you feel the need to run from that real and raw pain? And don't you think that there is one person in that congregation that is experiencing a similar heart state to yours? And so hearing this from God after wrestling for so long was relieving to say the very least, but I still did not want to embrace my emotions. But he showed me that in this instance, I should. And as it would turn out, the message that the Spirit of God had for this congregation was not one that ignored their reality. It was not one that was totally joyful and hopeful while they were in pain. But actually, it was one that reached the depths of the gaps that these people were feeling on this very day before Christmas. And so do we relate to this? Do you feel the pain of the world that we exist in? And this, my friends, was my simple example of how theology had to be moved from my very desk to the margins, but not the margins of the poor and the sidelined just yet, but rather simply to the margin of my own heart. And so I challenge us today to move our theology from the desks that we sit at to the margins of your heart and your pain. If contextual and liberation theology has its focus on theologizing from the location of the oppressed and building up from there, then is it not an authentic place to do that from your very soul? Before we are able to authentically connect to our external contexts, we have to connect to our internal context. And that means running away from the valid state of your soul a little less. In this brave act, the personal gap between theology and the context in which we exist can gradually be filled. The pain that we may feel about life and our world is actually what gives us a personal, contextual place in the world that we exist in. 
emotions that arise from the being present in the world prove to us that we exist. We exist in a time and a space, and we are connected to our existence. If contextual theology is what the Pope is seeing a need for, then personal context is a good place to start. Your heart. Your heart, where it intertwines with your theologizing or student theologizing. How it intertwines with your ministry or student ministry. And so the last question that I have been asked to consider is, what challenges and hopes arise from this apostolic letter? And to me, it's this. If we continue to try to escape the uncomfortable, painful parts of our context, both our personal ones and even the Caribbean context that we live in and the context of the world, then we have a challenge because we won't reach points of authentic contextual theology. We will continue to be afraid of aspects of our Caribbean context and our lives. And you know what? The people in our pastoral care will suffer for that. But if we were to make the brave steps towards embracing our personal contextual discomforts and finding the very theological principles that we study there and building up from those places of oppression, finding Christ in those places, then I think we have a hope. With more and more of us being emotionally present to ourselves, we can be emotionally present to our Caribbean. We can form deeper contextual frameworks that we need to fill the gaps between theology and pastoral ministry. So, ad theologium promovandum, to promote theology. May we find the ways to promote theology into the darkest corners of our very selves, so that we may promote it to the darkest corners of the world and to our existence. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, thank you for affirming the quality and the value of Caribbean theology and affirming the fact that has been said prior that our theology has been liberational, it's been contextual. And then most of all, thank you for pointing us to a, the gap, the gap that is not external, but the gap that is internal and challenging us to perhaps that's where we need to, to, to start looking at the personal, uh, embracing our personal emotional presence or being emotionally present to ourselves as the launching pad into becoming emotionally present to the world. And thank you for giving us that insight and I'm sure it has potential for further expansion and development and I hope that your current um, th um, theology lecture will challenge you to do so in class. <laughs>